Amen, amen. Uh, welcome to Port Cities Baptist Church, and I am so glad to be able to share the message today. As you can see, I'm overly excited, right? Because every time we have an opportunity to come to God's Word, it is His Word. It, is, it becomes alive. So uh, let us pray as we start today. Lord, we thank you for your presence. You are good. Your mercies are new every morning, and your word become alive every time we open up the scriptures. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be talking to our needs. So, Lord, would you talk to us today? Would you help us to hear your voice clearly, just the way that you can tell us through your word? In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let me start with a story. So I went about eight years ago on a mission trip to uh, Chiapas, Mexico, up in the mountains. And, uh, but it wasn't just in Chiapas, it was in the jungle, okay? So that's the context. We went there to provide training to some of the uh, local leaders, and uh, they were eager to receive God's word. So after a six-hour long day training that happens in mission trips, I mean, they're eager. So they're sitting down, they're grasping all the content. They don't want a break. I wanted a break. So after six hours, the pastor said, you know what? There is this beautiful, beautiful lagoon, like a lake, but it's up hidden in the forest. You have to walk. You have to walk. And he said, it's about, it's about 30 minutes. The journey is about 30 minutes. Don't worry about it. 30 minutes for them is like an hour or more. But so we embark ourselves into this journey. And he said, well, you need some guides. So I'm going to tell some of these boys from our village to serve as your guides. So here we are, a deacon of our former church and myself. You know, we're just walking, walking, walking. He says, you know, it is simple to get there. You get straight there, straight there. You walk, 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 and then you find a point of intersection. You're supposed to turn left, and then you walk, 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 and walk, and you find the lagoon. I said, well, good deal, something simple. So we started walking, walking. The boys started playing in the background. We heard them and until we didn't hear them anymore. And then the deacon, you know, always the deacons, they're troublemakers. They, they're like, he was telling me what, what happened with the boys. And I said, well, I don't know. Do you know, Do you know where to go? I said, I, I think we're going in the right direction. So we kept going and we were lost in the jungle. Okay, just to give you context, no phone signal, no GPS, which is the greatest invention ever, <laughs> but it's not working in the jungle. My anxiety levels started to kick in and I was kind of praying, I'm praying, I'm walking, and then finally we heard this voice in the background screaming, Pastor, Pastor, are you here? And I say, yes, I scream louder, you know, than right now. We're here, we're here. I was so happy to see these boys. I mean, their voices were like medicine to my ears. And he, well, he said, one of the boys said, you turn right instead of turning left, Pastor. Uh, but, you know, we were feeling like the famous hymn, we were lost, but now we were found. So we finally got to the destination, and we saw the lagoon. Beautiful, beautiful. How many times that happens in our lives? Come on, we, we think we're going in the right direction, and then we, we are honestly thinking we are going in the right direction, but then we are not going in the right direction. We face reality. And that's exactly what's happening to the church at Galatia. The apostle Paul is talking to them, and he already used six different arguments to prove that God saves sinners through faith alone in Christ and not by the works of the law. So he began with a personal argument, and he reminded them in chapter 3, of when they became believers, their personal experience, their, their encounter with the Lord. And then he moved into this scriptural argument. So he quoted about six verses or passages from the Old Testament uh, in case they didn't get it. Well, they didn't get it. So he kept going and he developed a logical argument on the basis as he reasoned with the readers comparing both covenants the covenant of the law, Moses, and the covenant of Christ. So he compared both of them. 
And then he moved into the historical argument. In case they didn't get the personal, you know, the logical, he moved into the historical argument, how the law plays a significant role in the people of Israel. How the law served as a tutor, as a teacher, to show the sins, but he was incapable of changing people. So he developed his historical argument, and then he went into his sentimental argument in chapter 4, and he, uh, he told them, you know what, when I went to see you all the first time, you accepted me, you welcomed me with open arms, and, and you welcomed me like an angel, like I was Jesus Christ. Just read the scriptures, that's what it says. But now that I'm telling you to go back to the gospel of grace, I became an enemy. How is that? So he tried hard to hard conversation, didn't work. Then he moved into the allegorical argument. As he pointed out the example of Hagar, and Sarah, Ishmael, and Isaac, the law and the promise. And then, you know, he developed four chapters in his theological background of what is it that the gospel, it is only by grace. So now we move into chapter five and chapter six, and this is where the application comes. I love the praxis. I love the application. So if you didn't come the last, I don't know how many weeks, this was a recap for free for you, okay? <laughs> now we move into chapter five, and, and he's, he's plainly stating this. We have been set by, by Christ, you know, free by Christ, and we are no longer under the bondage of the law. Let me repeat it again. We have been set free by Christ, and we are no longer under bondage to the law. So the, the first argument that he develops is the same one he continues to develop all the time. <laughs> it is only by grace. So he talks about the need of someone or something to control our life from within. And that within is the Holy Spirit. So the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, it is active in you and I. So he says, it is not by works, it is by the Spirit. So the question comes into mind, how is it that we can live by the Spirit? How is it that we can walk by the Spirit? How is it that we do that? So today in our sermon series entitled, Finding Freedom in Christ, we'll be talking about finding freedom over sin. And for this purpose, we're going to dive into Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25. And I brought the scriptures here, printed, okay? In case you say, Pastor Orlando just preaches with the iPad. <laughs> this is what the Word of God says. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. So our Christian walk, it is a journey. It is not only a destination. Sometimes we simplify that the Christian life is for eternity. Eternity starts here. I mean, here, now. So the Christian life, it is a journey, not only a destination. So today we're going to look at the uh, definition of the journey, a description of this journey, and then the destination of the journey. Let's start with the uh, definition of the journey, verses 16 to 18. Paul has mentioned that we are saved only by faith and not by the works of the flesh. 
Real freedom is not actually doing whatever you want to do, but doing what you ought to do. Let me repeat it again. You can hashtag right there, Rolando Aguirre. Real freedom is not actually doing whatever you want to do, but doing what you ought to do. We are broken people. It is not by the works of the law. It is only by grace. We are motivated to do whatever we want to do if we drive ourselves in our flesh. Our pastor, Pastor Jeff, mentioned this clearly a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about idol worship. He said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, the one that we just read, Paul says, walk by, and then he says, keep in step with the Spirit, and will, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And the word you find here for desire in Greek is epitumia. Repeat after me, epitumia. You know Greek already. Epitumia. And, and this term is used over and over again. We see it in Ephesians, in 1 Peter, in John, in James. And it's often translated lost. So you think about sets or sexual things. But it is much more than that. It actually means over-desire, and over-desire for things of this world that are not necessarily bad things, but good things, but it's an over-desire. So the prefix epi means over, on, upon. It is the entire thing. It's like the epicenter of an earthquake. It is the center. So we have an epi-desire. That means the greatest intensity of desire over desire, an uber-desire. And over desire for even especially good things. So we lost over our jobs, our families, our children. We desire good things that even drive us into our identities and then into bondage and into change. The chains that takes us back to the flesh. And the Bible says, Christ has set us free from bondage. Can I get an amen for that? You know you have to help me out here. So he, he describes here the desire for good things and bad things as the desire of the flesh. So he describes two pathways. The first one is the pathway of the flesh. And the second one is the pathway of the spirit. So the pathway of the flesh takes us to conflict. Verse 16 says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires... Of the flesh are contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict to each other. So the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. There is a constant conflict that we need to be aware of. It. The desires of the flesh. You know, I, I said it again the flesh cannot be more fleshy. I mean, it is. I mean, our flesh is neutral, but if you feed it with the Holy Spirit, if it is controlled with the Holy Spirit, you are walking in the Spirit. But if it's fed by the desires, the uber, the love over the things, it's going to be fleshy, of course. You know, the Apostle Paul is one of my heroes in the New Testament. I mean, he wrote like three-thirds of the New Testament inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he struggles with it. So there is, there is some hope for you and I. He says, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, he uses the word hate, I do. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. This is the reality. He's not having problems of, you know, like multiple personality disorder. No, he's having a spiritual problem. So the Christian life is not a playground. It is a battlefield. Let me repeat it again. The Christian life is not a playground. It is a battlefield. Every single day, you and I, we get up in the morning and we face reality with a battlefield. It is our flesh or our spirit trying to domain and to rule over our thoughts, our actions, the way that we behave, and the Apostle Paul, my hero, says, you know what? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I try to do the good thing, but I cannot do it. And then he concludes, it is only by grace. It is only by grace. And that continues to be one of our values because it is fundamentally 
fundamentally important that we believe that is only by grace and grace alone. Amen? And then we see the pathway of the Spirit, which is going to lead us to victory. You know, we sing so many hymns. There is victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Remember? He bought me. And then people leave the church and they don't even know what it is. They continue to struggle in the flesh. And the apostle is saying, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Most people believe that real happiness comes with freedom, which is defined as liberation from any outside authority. So modern freedom is to be freed from something or someone to something else. We hear things like, I can do whatever I want as long as I don't hurt anybody. Have you heard that? I can do whatever I want if I don't hurt anybody. I mean, what's with you? It's kind of fair, right? Well, that's not freedom. It is bondage. You know, obedience is the pathway to freedom. Let me repeat it. Obedience is the pathway to freedom. Can you repeat it with me? Obedience is the pathway to freedom. You have to do it with the Colombian accent, okay? <laughs> the solution is not to try to subdue our against, you know, our flesh against the spirit. It's not trying that, it's letting go. It's letting the spirit dominate our hearts and our, li our lives. You know, this verse literally means, but if you are willingly led by the spirit, then you are not under the law. If you are willingly led by the spirit, you are not under the law. That's what it means. So we see that. And then we see the description of the journey. Verses 19 to 23. He talks about the works, plural, of the flesh. And now Paul now lists some ugly works of the flesh. I mean, you can find similar lists in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 to 23, if you have time. Or Romans chapter 1, verses 29 to 32. Or 1 Timothy 1, verse 9. Or 2 Timothy 3. I mean, you can find so many lists, right? We focus on this one, but we find many in the scriptures. This is just a description of how it looks like. And the apostle is trying to say that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. He knew that. He knew the scriptures. So he listed different categories. I, I, I just put like three, but you, you might disagree, but I think it's like three or four. The first category is the sensual th sins. The sensual sins. These are all the sins related to sexual things. It could be fornication, adultery. The word pornea in Greek means anything that is sexual outside of the boundaries of marriage, pretty much. That's where the word porn comes out from. So he's saying there is, there is that category right there. Then the second category is the superstitious sins. And this idolatry, it is simply putting things ahead of God. We are to worship God, love people, and use things. But too often we use people, love ourselves, worship things, and leave God out of the equation. That's how we operate. Conceptually, we know what to do. But practically, we do completely the opposite. Jesus tells us that whatever we worship, we will serve. The word witchcraft comes from the Greek word parmakia which means use of drugs. That's where we get the word pharmacy. So in Paul's days, there were a lot of magicians that will do evil things with the sake of doing good things. They will do evil things. And somehow this mixture of beliefs have, you know, ingrained the church as well. And then they were syncretists. They will believe in different things. And the apostle is saying it is only Christ and Christ alone. It is the gospel of grace. It is just that. Don't try those things. So anything that displaces God from the first place in our hearts is idolatry. Paul is not talking about an act of sin, but a habit of sin. He's not saying if you sin one time, you're going to lose your salvation. No. But he's saying those who practice these things, it is a habitual thing every day. So if you are born by the Spirit, you want to grow spiritually. There is a false assurance of salvation that is not based on the Word of God. 
The fact is that the believer is not under the law, but under grace. And there is no excuse for sinning. I grew up in church, and uh, I don't know how many times I, I confess my sins, thinking that I have lost my salvation, until I understood completely the gospel of grace. However, there is this dichotomy. Some people believe that, you know, once saved, always saved. Yes, but if you're saved, you're going to give fruit. There is a fruit that is going to become evident in your life and in my life. I mean, the little tree is not going to be little all the time. I have some trees in my backyard. And I was telling the first service that pastors don't have good gardens unless, I mean, if you find a pastor that has good gardens, just email me the picture. But we just, I don't know, maybe you don't have time for it. But I mean, my trees live out of grace and mercy. <laughs> Everything that rains fits them. Glory to the Lord for the rain. But there is one that is, uh, is not dead. The other one, I think my, my wife was telling me yesterday, you have to look at that tree. I said, it's not dead, honey. I think it's just, it's, it's, it's alive somewhere in there. <laughs> you have to prune it. She says, yes, yeah, I have to do it. Oh my goodness. I, I also pull out some wheat. I mean, uh, it, this summer, I, we were gone, you know, a few weeks. And, and then I did it like in June. The guys caught the grass. I don't do that, but, but they charge more to cut, you know, pull out the wheat. So I do it myself, supposedly. Then I didn't do it for like two months. And, and I mean, it grows. Horrible. Horrible. Uh, next time I call some of you to help me. Pulling out weeds is horrible. Same thing happens in our spiritual life. We have to pull out the weeds so that the fruit could grow. And this is what it talks about here. And it moves into the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spiritual. You, we see the social sins in here. That's the third category. Social sins and jealousy, challenges, hatred, you know, drunkenness. Have you seen a drunk person? I mean, I'm not going to get in the debate if you drink or not, if it's sin. I mean, I'm not legalistic. But the point is, if you're drunk, it is a sin. I just put period right there. <laughs> then let's move into the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Woo, woo. We know the song, right? But it's so hard. The Spirit enables us to produce fruit. It is one thing to overcome the flesh and do not do evil things, but quite differently to do good things by the Holy Spirit. Negative goodness is not enough in our Christian walk. There must be enough Christian walk in the spirit. The contrast between works and the fruit is important. For example, a machine in a factory works and turns out a good product, but it could never manufacture fruit. I have never seen a machine in a factory that manufactures fruit. Have you seen a factory that manufactures pears or apples? Take me, please. You will not find it. That's the law. The law will point out what you have to do, but it's, it's incapable of producing fruit. The fruit comes from something that is alive. And that life comes from the Holy Spirit that resides in our lives. The flesh produces dead works, but the Spirit of God produces living fruit. This fruit has in it the seed for still much more fruit. Love produces more love. Joy helps to produce more joy. Jesus helps us to have peace, that peace that surpasses all understanding. You know, that takes me to Paul's experience in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 4. Remember, you know the verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. But if you look at the context, it is long suffering, trial, pain, tribulation. Yes. And then he's just saying, I cannot do this thing. It is Christ in me. So we have to distinguish between the gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit is pretty much the Holy Spirit when you come to Jesus and you say, I'm going to follow Jesus. The Spirit of God comes and resides in you. Amen. Are you following me? Secondly, we have the gifts of the Spirit, which is the donea, which is the gifts that you have to serve God. You teach, you, you, know, you prophesy, tell the truth, all these things. And then you have the graces of the Spirit, which has to do with character. This is what the apostle is saying here. The graces of the Spirit, the characteristics. And he's talking about ninefold 
characteristics. I don't have the time because I have to land the plane in 10 minutes. However, I'm going to tell you one thing. All these characteristics depend on one, and that's love. The word love is agape, which means divine love. The word eros, meaning sensual love, is never used in the New Testament. The word phileo is used sometimes in the New Testament as well, but this is divine love. And this is what you contrast the list here, love, joy, patience, kindness, to the Apostle Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 13. Remember, have you been in, in Christian weddings? The passage that is overly used is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is what? Kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It is not self-seeking. So the apostle is comparing. Uh, by the way, in parentheses, this is a corrective letter. Corinthians is not a poem. It is a corrective letter. So the apostle is describing what love is not in order to describe what it is. And his conclusion to all his thesis statement, to his premise, it is, it is impossible. It is only through the agape love. The agape love of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. It is the divine love. See, if you are loved by the Spirit, if you have loved by God with the agape love, is the same word that is used in John 3, 16. For God so agape the, law, the world that he gave his only begotten son, so whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know that verse? You are a member of a Baptist church. Amen. <laughs> At least. You know, and this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And that piece that trespasses all understanding. He's talking about the ninefold characteristics of the Holy Spirit. The, the first three talk about long suffering. The, the, the final three talks about the self word. You know, all these characteristics. And he talks about meekness that is not weakness. Jesus said, I am meek and lowly in heart. And Moses was very meek. He was very meek. So he talks about these characteristics. He talks about the characteristics that are personal, communal, and then divine. Oh, but all of them are founded and grounded in God's love. If you get that one, if you are embraced by God's agape love, it is unconditional. It is unbreakable. It is never giving up. Uh, that's the only way. I can love my wife. I can love my kids. Uh, that's God's love. Can I get an amen for that? Okay, well, the other service was better than you guys. Okay, third one, the destination of the journey. So here is a hashtag phrase, okay, right there. Jesus designed a journey, goes with us in the journey, and will be with us at the end of the journey. He designed our journey, he goes with us, and will be with us at the end of the journey. He said it. He promised to be with us all the time. And surely I will be with you always to the end of the very age. So what do we do, Pastor Rolando David Aguirre? What do we do? We must crucify our own nature. We must crucify our own nature. You know, we need to live in a cruciform life. A life that looks like the cross, willing to die and resurrect in likeness with him. That's what is called cruciform type of life. We need to die. Galatians 2.20, it is the fundamental verse of Galatians. And you heard it in different versions, especially the King James. I'm going to read the NIV for my sake. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is Christ living in us and through us. That's the key. So we need to crucify ourselves, our ego, yes, and let Christ live and operate in us. We're going to have baptisms outside here on September 25th. So if you haven't been baptized, please let us know at the end of the service. We had two boys in the first service. They came up and they said, I want to follow Jesus in baptism. I was telling them, you made my day. Because being baptized is, is giving a public testimony that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That I'm going to follow Christ. No, uh, Cristo. I, I, I say my Spanish. Christ. You know Cristo. You know that. 
Are you going to follow Christ? No matter what happens in my life. And that's coming from Latin, actually, Christus. You know what? We are crucified with Christ. Second, we must cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. As I was telling you, you know, verse 25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. The cultivation of the fruit is important. Paul tells us that we need to have the conditions for that fruit to grow. And that's only through living a life in total dependence and surrender to the Holy Spirit. He's pulling out the weeds. So be filled with the Spirit today. The key to be free from bondage of sin is the Holy Spirit. That's the key today, sisters and brothers. That's the key. The key to be free from bondage of sin is the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. If we keep this command, it could really change our lives. You know, will you let the Holy Spirit work in you and through you? Will you be more like loving and patient? Will you be more kind to others? Will you exemplify goodness? Can you be always faithful? Can you control yourself? And the answer is no. If you are feeling bad, it's no. But we can do this through the Holy Spirit. That's the only way, including myself. So that kind of power is available to everyone who will be filled with the Spirit. And when you talk about filled with the Spirit, it's not like filling a cup, it's being controlled by the Spirit, okay? If you didn't know, I mean, you owe it to me. You owe me a lunch. I'm Latino. I take my family, so it's four of us. <laughs> are you willing to confess our sins? I mean, are we willing to repent? Repent means basically changing directions. Are we willing to yield total control of our lives to the Lord? Are we willing to be the people that he saved us to be?